On the afternoon of June 5th, Le Turcolte James Earl Rudder, CO of the Ranger Force, paid a visit to Companies A, B and C of the 2nd Battalion. He was going to lead Companies D, E and F on an assault at Pointe du Hoc, a sheer cliff some 40 metres high about 7 kilometres west of the right flank of Omaha Beach. A, B and C were going in at the Charlie sector of Omaha, to the immediate right of Company A of the 116th Regiment. Rudder, a 1932 graduate of Texas, knew well how to give inspirational talks before going into action. On this occasion, he told companies A, B and C, Boys, you are going on the beach as the first rangers in this battalion to set foot on French soil. But don't worry about being alone. When D, E and F take care of Pointe du Hook, we will come down and give you a hand with your objectives. Good luck and may God be with you. In the event, almost none of this worked out, not for A, B and C, or for D, E and F. Most of the game plan had to be abandoned even before the action began. C Company was alone when it landed, and virtually alone through the day. D, E and F companies came in at the wrong time from the wrong direction at Pointe du Hoc. Most of the special equipment for scaling the cliff never made it to the shore, much of what did failed to work. When the companies nevertheless made it to the top, they found that their objective, five 155 metermit cannon capable of dominating both Utah and Omaha beaches, were not in the casemates. Apparently, what the Rangers had accomplished in one of the most famous and heroic actions of D-Day had gone for naught, and the skills and sacrifices of one of the most elite and highly trained forces in the Allied army had been wasted. But in fact, what the Rangers accomplished at Omaha and at Pointe du Hoc was critical to the ultimate success at both American beaches. The plan was for Company C to land on the far right flank of Omaha Beach, and follow Company A of the 116th Regiment up the Vierville Draw, pass through the village, turn right, and clear out the area between the beach and the coastal road running from Vierville to Pointe de Hoc. In that area, the Germans had some 20 pillboxes, bunkers, towbrooks, and open gun emplacements, plus a radar station. The schedule called for Company C to accomplish its mission in two hours, that is, by 008.30. Companies A and B would land at 0730 at Pointe du Hoc if given a signal that Rudder needed them there for reinforcement. If no signal was received, they would land at the mouth of the Vierville Draw, from which spot they would move to the high ground, turn right, and proceed west on the coastal road to attack Pointe du Hoc from the land side. For Ranger companies A, B and C, in short, Everything depended on Company A of the 116th Regiment securing the Via Villa draw and the village itself in the initial moments of the assault, but Company A of the 116th was weeped out at the beach. Company C of the Rangers came in a few minutes later, at 0645, in an isolated position, at the far western edge of Omaha, just beyond the Viaville draw. The closest American troops were more than two kilometres to the east at Dog Red. Going in on the heels of the naval bombardment, before the Germans opened fire, the Rangers were in a cocky mood. It's going to be a cinch, one of them said. I don't think they know we're coming. They cheered when the LCTRs launched their rockets, only to groan when they saw the rockets fall short and harmlessly in the water. Their dismay increased as they realised, in the words of Lotte Gerald Heaney, there was no one on the beach in front of us and we were going to touch down in a sector that had not been invaded by other American soldiers. When Heaney's LCA hit a sandbar, the British coxswain called out a cheery, This is as far as I go, Yanks, and lowered the ramp. German machine gun fire ripped across the boat. The first man out was immediately hit. Heaney saw he had no chance if he went down the ramp, so he jumped over the side. All around me men were being killed and wounded. I ran as hard as I could toward shore, and I remember being so exhausted when I reached the shore that it was all I could do to make it to the cliff. He made it to the shelter at the base of the cliff. The cliff was sheer, about 30 metres high, just to the west of the Vierville Draw. 
At its base, men were out of sight of German machine gunners, but still vulnerable to mortar fire and to grenades dropped over the edge by Germans on top. They were concussion grenades, universally called potato mashers by the GIs because of their shape. Sergeant Scribner's boat was hit three times by artillery fire. The first shell tore the ramp completely off the boat, killing the men in front and covering the others with blood. The second hit the port side. Scribner started to climb over the rear starboard side when he noticed a 60mm mortar lying on the bottom of the craft. He stopped to pick it up when the third shell tore out the starboard side. Somehow he made it into the water. I was carrying a radio, my rifle, my grenades, my extra ammunition, my bedroll, all my gear, and I started sinking in the channel. I didn't think I was ever going to stop going down. Scribner made it to the shore, he cannot recall how, and tried to run across the beach. Lord Sidney Salomon, leading 2nd Platoon of C Company, was first off his boat. He went to the right into chest-deep water as automatic weapons and rifle fire sprayed the debarking rangers. The second man off, Sergeant Oliver Reed, was hit. Salomon reached over and pulled him from under the ramp just as the craft surged forward on a wave. He told Reed to make it the best he could and started wading toward the shore. By this time, the Germans had zeroed in on the ramp. Ranger after ranger was hit by small arms fire as they jumped into the water and in addition mortar shells landed around the craft, making geysers of water. Salomon made the base of the cliff. He looked back. Bodies lay still, where they had fallen, trickles of blood reddening the sand. Some of the wounded were crawling as best they could, some with a look of despair and bewilderment on their tortured and pain-racked faces. Others tried to get back on their feet, only to be hit again by enemy fire. Bodies rolled back and forth at the water's edge, the English Channel almost laughing as it showed its might over man and played with the bodies as a cat would with a mouse. Of the 68 rangers in Company C, 19 were dead, 18 wounded. Only 31 men made it to the base of the cliff. The company had yet to fire a shot. Its experience in the first few minutes on French soil had been nearly as disastrous as that of A Company 116th. But the rangers had some advantages. Despite the grenades and mortar fire, they were more secure at the base of the cliff than the survivors of A Company were at the seawall on the other side of the Vierville Draw. Their company commander, Captain Ralph Goranson, along with two platoon leaders, Litz William Moody and Sidney Salomon, were with them to provide leadership, and they were elite troops brought to a fever pitch for this moment. For example, Sergeant Scribner recalled Sergeant Duke Golas. He had about half his head blown away by a grenade, and he was still standing at the bottom of the cliff firing his weapon, hollering at the krauts up above to come out and fight. The officers, meanwhile, realised the company was alone, that the Vireville draw was not only not opened but was bristling with German defenders, and that their only alternative, other than cowering at the base of the cliff and getting killed, was to climb the cliff. Fortunately, they had been through cliff-climbing training and had some special equipment for the task. Lieutenants Moody and Salomon and Sergeants Julius Belcher and Richard Garrett moved to their right until they found a crevice in the cliff. Using their bayonets for successive handholds, pulling each other along, they made it to the top of the crest. There, Moody attached some toggle ropes to stakes in a minefield and dropped them to the base of the cliff enabling the remainder of the company to monkey-walk them to the top. By 0730, Company C of the 2nd Ranger Battalion, or what was left of it, was on the crest. According to the official army history, it was probably the first assault unit to reach the high ground. On the cliff, the rangers saw what they always called thereafter a fortified house. Behind the house, the Germans had numerous Tobruks and other types of pillboxes, plus an extensive trench system. From the house, the Germans were firing on the rangers. C Company's mission was to move west along the high ground, but Captain Goranson decided to first of all attack the house and clean out the trenches behind it. Lieutenant Moody led a patrol against the house. He kicked in the door and killed the officer in charge, then began a search through the trenches. Moody was killed by a bullet through his forehead. Lieutenant Salomon took command of the patrol. 
It moved down the trenches using white phosphorus grenades to clear out pillboxes. Sir George Morrow and Julius Belcher spotted a machine gun that was enfilading the western end of Omaha Beach, one of those guns that had killed so many rangers an hour earlier. It was firing continuously down at the beach again as the follow-up waves attempted to get across the sand. In a pitiless rage, Belcher ran toward the position, oblivious of his own safety. He kicked in the door of the pillbox and threw in a white phosphorus grenade. As the phosphorus began to burn on their skins, the Germans abandoned their gun and ran out the door, screaming in agony. Belcher shot them down as they emerged. Captain Goranson, meanwhile, had seen a section of men from the 116th Regiment landing just below the cliff. He sent a ranger down to guide them to the top, providing C Company with its first reinforcements. The Germans were constantly reinforcing, bringing men in from the draw and the village via their communications trenches. There were far more German than American reinforcements. At Utah, the paratroopers prevented the Germans from sending reinforcements forward to the beach. At Omaha, there were no paratroopers, and the Germans had freedom of movement behind the beach. An all-day firefight ensued on the cliff to the west of the Vierville draw. Goranson was not strong enough to dislodge the Germans. His men would clear out a trench, move on, only to have fresh German troops reoccupy the position. Lieutenant Salomon was leading a platoon of three men. He described a typical action. We proceeded further down the trench, around a curve. We came upon a German mortar crew in a fixed gun position. Some more grenades, more rifle and tommy gun fire, as we continued through the trenches. To Sergeant Scribner, it seemed that the day would never end. Lieutenant Salomon despaired. Looking down on the beach below, he saw chaos. Up until noon D-Day, he later commented, I thought the invasion was a failure, and I wondered if we could make a successful withdrawal and try the invasion sometime again in the near future. For most of the Rangers, this was the first combat experience. It was a mark of how well they had been trained, and a textbook example of what training can accomplish, that they completely outfought the Germans in their fortified positions. They did so not by fighting regardless of loss, but by using basic tactics carried out with enthusiasm balanced by proper caution. The next day, a US Army quartermaster burial party reported the result. There were 69 German dead in and around the fortified house and trench system, two American. For C Company of the Rangers and the section from the 116th, this was an isolated action. They were the only Americans on the west side of the Vierville draw. They were completely out of touch because all of the radios had been lost. They did get some help from the Navy, not always welcome. Unaware that the Rangers were on the cliff, destroyers fired some 20 millimeters and 5-inch guns on the position. Sergeant Scribner saw a 5-inch shell score a direct hit on a pillbox. He was amazed that it only put in a dent about 6 inches deep. Those Germans really knew how to build their emplacements. Sergeant William Lindsay was in a concrete pillbox when it received two direct hits from five-inch shells. He lost a tooth and was knocked silly by the concussion. Three times during the day he had to be stopped by fellow rangers from walking off the cliff. That evening he confronted Colonel Taylor of the 116th. Red-faced, cursing, he accused Taylor of stealing his rifle. All the while he had the rifle slung over his shoulder. The incident gave the rangers who saw it a laugh and a certain sympathy for the Germans caught inside their casemates when 14-inch shells from the battleships exploded against them. C Company had not completed its mission. Indeed, it could be said it never even got started on its mission. Its action was minor in scale, a small unit engagement of inconsequential size when measured by the number of men involved. Yet it was critical. By occupying the Germans on the west side of the Vierville draw and on the cliff, the rangers diverted some of the machine gun fire that otherwise would have added to the carnage on the beach. By no means did the rangers do it alone, but without them the passage up the Vierville draw would have been, at best, even more costly. At worst, no Americans would have gotten up that draw on D-Day. Companies A and B of the Second Rangers came in at 0740 on Dog Green, 
The 5th Ranger Battalion came in at 0750 on Dogwhite, to the east of the mouth of the Veerville Draw. There they became, in effect, a part of the 116th Infantry, to the point that many of the ad hoc fighting units formed on the beach were composed of a mix of rangers and infantry from the 116th. The Allied bombardment of Pointe de Hoc had begun weeks before D-Day. Heavy bombers from the US 8th Air Force and British Bomber Command had repeatedly plastered the area, with a climax coming before dawn on June 6th. Then the battleship Texas took up the action, sending dozens of 14-inch shells into the position. Altogether, Pointe du Hoc got hit by more than 10 kilotons of high explosives, the equivalent of the explosive power of the atomic bomb used at Hiroshima. Texas lifted her fire at show 630, the moment the rangers were scheduled to touch down. Colonel Rudder was in the lead boat. He was not supposed to be there. Lark Jenna Clarence Hubner, CO of the 1st Division and in overall command at Omaha Beach, had forbidden Rudder to lead companies D, E and F of the 2nd Rangers into Pont du Hoc, saying, We're not going to risk getting you knocked out in the first round. I'm sorry to have to disobey you, sir, Rudder had replied, but if I don't take it, it may not go. The rangers were in landing craft assault boats manned by British seamen. At 0630, as Rudder's lead LCA approached the beach, he saw with dismay that the coxswain was headed toward Pointe de la Percée, about halfway between the Vierville Draw and Pointe du Hoc. After some argument, Rudder persuaded the coxswain to turn right to the objective. The flotilla had to fight the tidal current and proceeded only slowly parallel to the coast. The error was costly. It caused the rangers to be 35 minutes late in touching down, which gave the German defenders time to recover from the bombardment, climb out of their dugouts and man their positions. It also caused the flotilla to run a gauntlet of fire from German guns along four kilometres of coastline. One of the four DUKWs was sunk by a 20mm shell. USS Satterley and HMS Talibont destroyers saw what was happening and came in close to fire with all guns at the Germans. That helped to drive some of the Germans back from the edge of the cliff. D Company had been scheduled to land on the west side of the point, but because of the error in navigation, Rudder signalled by hand that the two LCAs carrying the remaining D Company troops join the other seven and land side by side along the east side. Later George Kirschner, a platoon leader in D Company, recalled that when his LCA made its turn to head into the beach, my thought was that this whole thing is a big mistake, that none of us were ever going to get up that cliff. But then the destroyers started firing and drove some of the Germans back from the edge of the cliff. The beach at Pointe du Hoc was only ten metres in width as the flotilla approached, and shrinking rapidly as the tide was coming in. There was no sand, only shingle. The bombardment from air and sea had brought huge chunks of the clay soil from the point tumbling down, making the rocks slippery, but also providing an eight-metre build-up at the base of the cliff that gave the rangers something of a head start in climbing the forty-metre cliff. The rangers had a number of ingenious devices to help them get to the top. One was twenty-five-metre extension ladders mounted in the Duke KWs, provided by the London Fire Department. But one Duke KW was already sunk, and the other three could not get a footing on the shingle, which was covered with wet clay and thus rather like greased ball bearings. Only one ladder was extended. Sergeant William Stevenson climbed to the top to fire his machine gun. He was swaying back and forth like a metronome, German tracers whipping about him. Letter Elmer, Dutch Vermeer, described the scene. The ladder was swaying at about a 45-degree angle, both ways. Stiverson would fire short bursts as he passed over the cliff at the top of the arch, but the Duke floundered so badly that they had to bring the fire ladder back down. The basic method of climbing was by rope. Each LCA carried three pairs of rocket guns, firing steel grapnels which pulled up either plain three-quarter inch ropes, toggle ropes or rope ladders. The rockets were fired just before touchdown. Grapnels with attached ropes were an ancient technique for scaling a wall or cliff, tried and proven, but in this case, the ropes had been soaked by the spray, and in many cases were too heavy. 
Rangers watched with sinking hearts as the grapnels arched in toward the cliff, only to fall short from the weight of the ropes. Still, at least one grapnel and rope from each LCA made it. The grapnels grabbed the earth, and the dangling ropes provided a way to climb the cliff. To get to the ropes, the rangers had to disembark and cross the narrow strip of beach to the base of the cliff. To get there, the rangers had two problems to overcome. The first was a German machine gun on the ranger's left flank, firing across the beach. It killed or wounded 15 men as it swept bullets back and forth across the beach. Colonel Rudder was one of the first to make it to the beach. With him was Cole. Travis Trevor, a British commando who had assisted in the training of the rangers. He began walking the beach, giving encouragement. Lieutenant Vermeer yelled at him, how in the world can you do that when you are being fired at? I take two short steps and three long ones, Trevor replied, and they always miss me. Just then, a bullet hit him in the helmet and drove him to the ground. He got up and shook his fist at the machine gunner, hollering, You dirty man! After that, Vermeer noted, He crawled around like the rest of us. The second problem for the disembarking rangers was craters, caused by bombs or shells that had fallen short of the cliff. They were underwater and could not be seen. Getting off the ramp, Sergeant South recalled, my pack and I went into a bomb crater and the world turned completely to water. He inflated his May West and made it to shore. Lieutenant Kirchner was determined to be first off his boat. He thought he was going into a metre or so of water as he hollered, OK, let's go, and jumped. He went in over his head, losing his rifle. He started to swim in, furious with the British coxswain. The men behind him saw what had happened and jumped to the sides. They hardly got their feet wet. So instead of being the first one ashore, I was one of the last ashore from my boat. Two of his men were hit by the machine gun enfilading the beach. Kirshner picked up a dead ranger's rifle. My first impulse was to go after this machine gun up there, but I immediately realised that this was rather stupid, as our mission was to get to the top of the cliff and get on with destroying those guns. It wasn't necessary to tell this man to do this or that man to do that, Kirshner said. They had been trained. They had the order in which they were supposed to climb the ropes and the men were all moving right in and starting to climb up the cliff. Kirchner went down the beach to report to Colonel Rudder that the D Company commander's LCA had sunk. He told him to get the hell out of there and get up and climb his rope. Kirchner did as ordered. He found climbing the cliff very easy, much easier than some of the practice climbs back in England. The machine gun and the incoming tide gave Sergeant Jean Elder a certain urgency to get off the beach and up the cliff. He and his squad free-climbed as they were unable to touch the cliff. When they reached the top, I told them, Boys, keep your heads down, because headquarters has fouled up again and has issued the enemy live ammunition. Other rangers had trouble getting up the cliff. I went up about, I don't know, 40, 50 feet. Germans on the top managed to cut two or three of the ropes, while others tossed grenades over the cliff but barmen at the base and machine gun fire from Satterley kept most of them back from the edge. They had not anticipated an attack from the sea, so their defensive positions were inland. In addition, the rangers had tied pieces of fuse to the grapnels and lit them just before firing the rockets. The burning fuses made the Germans think that the grapnels were some kind of weapon about to explode, which kept them away. Within five minutes, rangers were at the top, Within 15 minutes, most of the fighting men were up. As the tide was reducing the beach to almost nothing, and because the attack from the sea was proceeding, Colonel Rudder told Lieutenant Eichner to send the code message, TILT. That told the floating reserve of A and B companies, 2nd Rangers and the 5th Ranger Battalion to land at Omaha Beach instead of Pointe du Hoc. Rudder expected them to pass through Vierville and attack Pointe du Hoc from the eastern, landward side. As I got over the top of the cliff, Lieutenant Kirchner recalled, it didn't look anything at all like what I thought it was going to look like. The rangers had studied aerial photos and maps and sketches and sand table mock-ups of the area, 
but the bombardment from air and sea had created a moonscape. It was just one large shell crater after the other. Fifty years later, Pointe du Hoc remains an incredible, overwhelming sight. It is hardly possible to say which is more impressive, the amount of reinforced concrete the Germans poured to build their casemates, or the damage done to them and the craters created by the bombs and shells. Huge chunks of concrete, as big as houses, are scattered over the kilometre square area, as if the gods were playing dice. Surprisingly, the massive concrete observation post at the edge of the cliff remains intact. It was the key to the whole battery. From it, one has a perfect view of both Utah and Omaha beaches. German artillery observers in the post had radio and underground telephone communication with the casemates. The craters are as big as 10 metres across, a metre or two deep, some even deeper. They number in the hundreds. They were a godsend to the rangers, for they provided plenty of immediate cover. Once on top, rangers could get to a crater in seconds, then begin firing at the German defenders. Each platoon had a specific mission, to knock out a specific gun emplacement. The men got on it without being told. Germans were firing sporadically from the trenches and regularly from the machine gun position on the eastern edge of the fortified area and from a 20mm anti-aircraft gun on the western edge, but the rangers ignored them to get to the casemates. When they got to the casemates, to their amazement, they found that the guns were telephone poles. Tracks leading inland indicated that the 155 millitera cannon had been removed recently, almost certainly as a result of the preceding air bombardment. The rangers never paused. The rangers never paused. In small groups, they began moving inland toward their next objective, the paved road that connected Grand Camp and Vierville, to set up roadblocks to prevent German reinforcements from moving to Omaha. Lieutenant Kirshner moved forward and got separated from his men. I remember landing in this zigzag trench. It was the deepest trench I'd ever seen. It was a narrow communications trench, two feet wide but eight feet deep. About every twenty-five yards it would go off on another angle. I was by myself and I never felt so lonesome before or since, because every time I came to an angle I didn't know whether I was going to come face to face with a German or not. Kirchner followed the trench for 150 metres before it finally ran out near the ruins of a house on the edge of the fortified area. Here he discovered that Pointe du Hoc was a self-contained fort in itself, surrounded on the land side with minefields, barbed wire entanglements and machine gun emplacements. This is where we began running into most of the German defenders, on the perimeter. Other rangers had made it to the road, fighting all the way, killing Germans, taking casualties. The losses were heavy. In Kirchner's D Company, only 20 men were on their feet, out of the 70 who had started out in the LCAs. Two company commanders were casualties. Lieutenants were now leading D and E capped. Otto Masny led F Company. Kirchner checked with the three COs and learned that all the guns were missing. So at this stage we felt rather disappointed. Not only disappointed, but I felt awfully lonesome as I realised how few men we had there. The lieutenants decided that there was no reason to go back to the fortified area and agreed to establish a perimeter around the road and try to defend ourselves and wait for the invading force that had landed on Omaha Beach to come up. At the base of the cliff at around 0730, Lieutenant Eichner sent out a message by radio. Praise the Lord. It signified that the rangers were on top of the cliff. At 0745, Colonel Rudder moved his command post up to the top, establishing it in a crater on the edge of the cliff. Captain Block also climbed a rope to the top and set up his aid station in a two-room concrete emplacement. The fighting within the fortified area was confused and confusing. Germans would pop up here, there, everywhere, fire a few rounds, then disappear back underground. Rangers could not keep contact with each other. Movement meant crawling. There was nothing resembling a front line. Germans were taken prisoner, so were some rangers. In the observation post, a few Germans held out despite repeated attempts to overrun the position. The worst problem was the machine gun on the eastern edge of the fortified area, 
the same gun that had caused so many casualties on the beach. Now it was sweeping back and forth over the battlefield whenever a ranger tried to move. Rudder told Lieutenant Vermeer to eliminate it. Vermeer set out with a couple of men. We moved through the shell craters and had just reached the open ground where the machine gun could cover us also when we ran into a patrol from F Company on the same mission. Once we ran out of shell holes and could see nothing but a flat 200 to 300 yards of open ground in front of us, I was overwhelmed with the sense that it would be impossible to reach our objective without heavy losses. The heaviest weapon the rangers had was a bar, hardly effective over that distance. Fortunately, orders came from Rudder to hold up a moment. An attempt was going to be made to shoot the machine gun off the edge of that cliff with guns from a destroyer. That had not been tried earlier because the Shorefire Control Party, headed by Captain Jonathan Harwood from the artillery and Navy Lieutenant Kenneth Norton, had been put out of action by a short shell. But by now Lieutenant Eichner was on top and he had brought with him an old World War I signal lamp with shutters on it. He thought he could contact the satellite with it. Rudder told him to try. Eichner had trained his men in the International Morse Code on the signal lamp. With the idea that we might just have a need for them, I can recall some of the boys fussing about having to lug this old outmoded equipment on D-Day. It was tripod-mounted, a dandy piece of equipment with a telescopic sight and a tracking device to stay lined up with a ship. We set it up in the middle of the shell hole command post and found enough dry cell batteries to get it going. We established communications and used the signal lamp to adjust the naval gunfire. It was really a lifesaver for us at a very critical moment. Satterley banged away at the machine gun position. After a couple of adjustments, Satterley's five-inch guns blew it off the cliffside. Eichner then used the lamp to ask for help in evacuating wounded. A whaleboat came in but could not make it due to intense German fire. The rangers were cut off from the sea. With the Veerville draw still firmly in German hands, they were getting no help from the land side. With the radios out of commission, they had no idea how the invasion elsewhere was going. The rangers on Pointe du Hoc were isolated. They had taken about 50% casualties. A short shell from British cruiser Glasgow had hit next to Rudder's command post. It killed Captain Harwood, wounded Lieutenant Norton, and knocked Colonel Rudder off his feet. Lieutenant Vermeer was returning to the CP when the shell burst. What he saw, he never forgot. The hit turned the men completely yellow. It was as though they had been stricken with jaundice. It wasn't only their faces and hands, but the skin beneath their clothes and the clothes which were yellow from the smoke of that shell. It was probably a coloured marker shell. Rudder recovered quickly. Angry, he went out hunting for snipers, only to get shot in the leg. Captain Block treated the wound. Thereafter, Rudder stayed in his CP, more or less, doing what he could to direct the battle. Vermeer remarked that the biggest thing that saved our day was seeing Colonel Rudder controlling the operation. It still makes me cringe to recall the pain he must have endured trying to operate with a wound through the leg and the concussive force he must have felt from the close hit by the yellow-coloured shell. He was the strength of the whole operation. On his return trip in 1954, Rudder pointed to a buried blockhouse next to his CP. We got our first German prisoner right here, he told his son. He was a little freckle-faced kid who looked like an American. I had a feeling there were more of them around, and I told the rangers to lead this kid ahead of them. They just started him around this corner when the Germans opened up out of the entrance and he fell dead, right here, face down with his hands still clasped on the top of his head. Out by the paved road, the fighting went on. It was close quarters, so close that when two Germans who had been hiding in a deep shelter hole jumped to their feet, rifles ready to fire, Sergeant Petty was right between them. Petty threw himself to the ground, firing his bar as he did so, but the bullets went between the Germans, who were literally at his side. The experience so unnerved them they threw their rifles down, put their hands in the air, and called out, Camarade! Camarade! A buddy of Petty's who was behind him commented dryly, Hell, Elrod, that's a good way to save ammunition. Just scare them to death. The primary purpose of the Rangers was not to kill Germans or take prisoners. 
but to get those 155mm cannon. The tracks leading out of the casemates and the effort the Germans were making to dislodge the rangers indicated that they had to be around somewhere. By 0815 there were about 35 rangers from companies D and E at the perimeter roadblock. Within 15 minutes another group of 12 from Company F joined up. Excellent soldiers, those rangers. They immediately began patrolling. There was a dirt road leading south. It had heavy tracks. Chance Leonard Lomel and Jack Kuhn thought the missing guns might have made the tracks. They set out to investigate. At about 250 metres, one kilometre inland, Lomel abruptly stopped. He held his hand out to stop Kuhn, turned and half whispered, Jack, here they are. We've found them. Here are the goddamned guns. Unbelievably, the well-camouflaged guns were set up in battery, ready to fire in the direction of Utah Beach with piles of ammunition around them. But no Germans. Lomel spotted about a hundred Germans a hundred metres or so across an open field, apparently forming up. Evidently, they had pulled back during the bombardment for fear of a stray shell setting off the ammunition dump and were now preparing to man their guns, but they were in no hurry for until their infantry drove off the rangers and reoccupied the observation post, they could not fire with any accuracy. Lomel never hesitated. Give me your grenades, Jack, he said to Kuhn. Cover me. I'm going to fix them. He ran to the guns and set off thermite grenades in the recoil and traversing mechanisms of two of the guns, disabling them. He bashed in the sights of the third gun. Jack, we got to get some more thermite grenades. He and Kuhn ran back to the highway, collected all of the thermite grenades from the rangers in the immediate area, returned to the battery, and disabled the other three guns. Meanwhile, Sergeant Frank Rupinski, leading a patrol of his own, had discovered a huge ammunition dump some distance south of the battery. It too was unguarded. Using high explosive charges, the rangers detonated it, a tremendous explosion occurred as the shells and powder charges blew up, showering rocks, sand, leaves and debris on Lomel and Kuhn. Unaware of Rupinski's patrol, Lomel and Kuhn assumed that a stray shell had hit the ammo dump. They withdrew as quickly as they could and sent word back to Rudder by Runner that the guns had been found and destroyed. And with that, the Rangers had completed their offensive mission. It was Eosho 9, Cray. Just that quickly, they were now on the defensive, isolated, with nothing heavier than 60mm mortars and bars to defend themselves. In the afternoon, Rudder had Eichner send a message via his signal lamp and homing pigeon, via the satellite. Located Pont de Hoc, mission accomplished. Need ammunition and reinforcement. Many casualties. An hour later, satellite relayed a brief message from General Hubner. No reinforcements available, all rangers have landed at Omaha. The only reinforcements Rudder's men received in the next 48 hours were three paratroopers from the 101st who had been misdropped and who somehow made it through German lines to join the rangers and two platoons of rangers from Omaha. The first arrived at 21 Sar. It was a force of 23 men led by Lieutenant Charles Parker. On the afternoon of June 7th, Madge and Jack Street brought in a landing craft and took off wounded and prisoners. After putting them aboard an LST, he took the craft to Omaha Beach and rounded up about 20 men from the 5th Ranger Battalion and brought them to Pointe de Hoc. The Germans were as furious as disturbed hornets. They counter-attacked the fortified area throughout the day, again that night and through the next day. The Rangers were, in fact, under siege, their situation desperate but as Sergeant Jean Elder recalled, they stayed calm and beat off every attack. This was due to our rigorous training. We were ready. Lieutenant Eichner was absolutely correct when he concluded his oral history. Had we not been there, we felt quite sure that those guns would have been put into operation and they would have brought much death and destruction down on our men on the beaches and our ships at sea. But by 09 Sozex on D-Day morning, the big guns had been put out of commission and the paved highway had been cut and we had roadblocks denying its use to the enemy. So by 09 Sovand, our mission was accomplished. The Rangers at Pointe de Hoc were the first American forces on D-Day to accomplish their mission 
and we are proud of that.